Let's spend about 10 minutes talking Kansas State football, basketball, and recruiting on KSO Today, a free daily podcast brought to you by K-State Online. It is Monday, February 17th, 2020. My name is Matt Hall, and this is your KSO Today. I was in Fort Worth this past weekend to cover Kansas State loss to TCU and Schulmeyer Arena there, and I will get to the struggling K-State basketball program here at the end of this morning's show, but a few other things first. One, uh, a quick shout out to both People State Bank and Legacy Insurance Solutions, sponsors of the KSO Show and KSO Today. Both have locations in Manhattan with PSB featuring nine other bank locations throughout the state of Kansas. Big thanks to them as always. Uh, and before we get to hoops, I want to talk about something a little more positive, I guess, and football related, which is something I think Derek maybe had said to me in the car when we we're going somewhere. Maybe it was the Iowa State game last week. It was just the idea that if you look at the start of K-State's football schedule, it sets up pretty nicely um, to start 2020. We're a long way from football. We're not even to spring football yet, but we will sneak in football stuff here every so often on KSO today. Uh, because we're not going to be doing KSO today's in the off season. It's going to be just every day during basketball and football season. So if I don't talk some now, I'll miss a little bit. So that's the message I want to look at first, is if you really look at K-State's football schedule, a great start really is possible. Um, I want to go game by game to the first six or seven. We could do the whole thing, but my point is you could get really six games into this thing and be looking at minimum five and one perhaps, Four and two at worst, maybe six and up. Things go well. You open with Buffalo at home. Uh, no game, of course, is a sure thing. We see upsets all the time. But when you look at openers at home against bu- teams like Buffalo, and then game two against North Dakota, you've got to win those two games at home to start two and zero. It's something that should be expected, of course. And I think K State can certainly take care of. You will face a Power Five team in Vanderbilt at home. Uh, game three, K State, of course, lost this Vanderbilt team under Bill Snyder a few years ago in Nashville, a game that I was at, and I know a lot of K State fans were at and were very frustrated with. So, again, this is a game that's no sure thing. Much, much different level than the first two, of Buffalo and North Dakota. This will be a, an extreme challenge, of course, for K State. But again, you have to like the Wildcats at home against a team like Vanderbilt, I believe. That gets you to 3 0. At least you'll be a heavy favorite to get to 3 0. People like to complain a lot about K-State starting on the road to the Big 12. Uh, I'll be honest, it's something I don't really get the the complaints about as you will play, you know, the same number of home and road games alternating every year when they come. I don't know how much that matters. I think sometimes you'd like to be able to finish some games at home. Either way, K-State does go on the road against West Virginia to start Big 12 play before getting two games at home to back that up in Big 12 play. They go to see a Mountaineer team that did beat K-State in Manhattan last year. So I keep saying this, these things aren't automatic. K-State lost to West Virginia last year. Now they go to Morgantown, year two for Neil Brown, too. You would think they get better as Chris Kleiman's program gets better in Manhattan as well. But a game that you think K-State may be favored in, people are going to look at this as an 8-4 and team last year. I guess 8-5 and after the bowl game against a team that didn't go to a bowl. K-State has a lot to replace on the offensive line, but otherwise, I think to the untrained eye, will look like it has a lot coming back, and the Wildcats do in many places. I think, again, you're favored there. So K-State may be favored to be 4-0 at this point. The best team you'll play early, of course, is Texas at home. The Longhorns will, again, I'm sure, receive plenty of preseason hype, but I don't say that in a passive-aggressive way. They'll be a talented team, and I understand why people will be impressed with them coming in. They'll need to prove something at some point, of course, but it will be a challenging game. K-State lost to Texas last year by about three points, I believe, in Austin. So kind of the inverse of this West Virginia game, a team that you lost to, but now you get them at home, a little bit better situation. Again, K-State may be favored here. I would think against Texas at home, particularly if you're 3-1 and one at first at worst, or maybe 4-0, and oh, you could be favored here. Next, after that, you play Kansas at home. I could keep going. Like I said, the point of this was to look at the first six games and point, look at it this way. Yes, you do open a Big 12 play on the road, but 83% of your games of your first six are at home. Five of six are at home. Two of three of your first Big 12 games are at home. You're not playing Oklahoma or Baylor in your first three games. You know, the teams that were certainly the best in the league last year. We'll see about Baylor without Matt Rule going forward. But still, two teams you think would be pretty good and a big challenge is on your schedule. So you don't play the two best teams from the Big 12 last year in the first six. You only leave home one time. The only time you do go on the road is to play what will be perceived as a lower-level Big 12 team in West Virginia. So I just think it's really, really exciting. I thought Kansas State last year got off to a better start than I ever projected them to get off to, even got into the top 25 after beating Mississippi State before falling at Oklahoma State. I think this year's schedule sets up better. You don't have a trip as challenging as at Mississippi State early. I don't think at West Virginia is as challenging of a trip as that. Again, I keep saying nothing is guaranteed, but I really like the Wildcats' chances to get off to a hot start. 
um, in the season people will be very much looking forward to. And then you get into the idea of this young offensive line. If K State's fortunate enough to be, you know, five and one, um, heaven forbid, you know, six and zero oh after those first six games, and that group has some confidence and gets rolling, you would think it could be a very positive season for K State. Come other some other things about this week on the site. Lots of recruiting coverage from Derek Young. Um, he just never relents on that, and I really appreciate it. He's such a self starter and works so hard. He released a brand new recruiting notebook on this past Saturday. I kind of snuck in there during game day. So if you haven't seen that, it was very good. I hope you check it out. He has a new big board he released this morning. He has a recruit update. I think it's on a receiver. Well, I know it is. I've looked at the story and said it. But it's on a receiver mentioned in his big board. That will release at noon today. And I know he also has his linebacker recruiting preview coming tomorrow as that series continues. Another small football note. I'll have a wide receiver position preview, kind of an off-season outlook we've been doing on a regular basis that will run Wednesday on the site, I believe. We will be heading to St. Louis this week to catch both Davion Bradford and Luke Kasubki in back-to-back nights on Wednesday and Thursday in St. Louis. Really big thanks to Grant Flanders for setting that up. I know it was a lot of work for him. Um, and we'll have to do a little, you know, some work there with the video and that kind of stuff. But we're excited to bring you highlights of those players, interviews from those players. It'll be very exciting for us to get to do that, and I hope you enjoy it too. So I want to wrap it up talking about K-State's loss at TCU this past week. Like I said, I went down to Fort Worth and was in the building as the Wildcats lost to the Horn Frogs. You know, bluntly, I thought K-State would beat TCU this past week, and the Horn Frogs were playing, I believed, worse than K-State going into that game. I didn't think they'd get much of a home court advantage, and I don't think they had much of one um, when I was there. But it didn't make a difference. K-State took a 52-51 lead with about six or seven minutes left to play and got hammered after that. You know, they were down 13 um, very quickly and then lost. There's no excuse to lose, you know, three games in a row, even though two are on the road to Iowa State, Oklahoma State, and TCU. Uh, You don't have to win all three. Uh, And K-State's not good enough to have won all three, to be quite honest. But those are three teams having similar seasons to you, and you lost all three back-to-back-to-back. So um, as you look at the season and talk about this thing big picture, to be totally transparent with everybody listening, I don't don't really understand the desperate need that, you know, some have to assign blame, you know, for the season. I guess that's for two reasons from my perspective. One, uh, I guess I don't know the value of that in a situation when you know full well a coaching change isn't going to happen. Whether you agree with that or don't agree with that, you have your own right for sure. And you could that doesn't mean... Don't talk about it. You can talk about it. You can ask for it if you want it. That's not what I'm suggesting. But if you know it's not going to happen, you know, I don't know the, the need to find a way to point out who's doing this, you know, who's doing this wrong. Uh, absolutely be frustrated when a team's having one of its worst ever Big 12 seasons. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't be. But I don't know if trying to find whose fault it is makes you feel any better. But then second, if you're trying to find fault, the coaching staff is always responsible. Uh, it's pretty simple. Even if you wanted to single out a single player, and I see a lot of this, not just with Cartier Jada. I see fans moving on to Xavier Sneed or trying to make him the example now or going through it. Whether whether it's the players or not, the coaches are still responsible for that player, all the players. This record is going to show on Bruce Weber's career bio. Um, they don't do the same thing for players. The players care. I'm not saying it won't hurt them as much. It may hurt them more. But if you're looking to assign blame, you know, the coaching staff's going to have this record by their names. That's who owns this. They're not going to throw this on. um, Xavier Sneed cares about this tremendously, so I'm not making fun of Xavier Sneed here. But it's not going to show on, you know, Xavier Sneed's career record the same way you'll see his stats, his points, his rebounds. They don't typically throw a record at the bottom of that. So uh, technically speaking and literally speaking, if you're looking for blame, I think it's, you know, I I think it's on the coaching staff because that's who owns every program. Um, and that's the way this staff has handled it too. I think when they've won, they have praised the players when they've lost. I think they'll say things that certainly, um, make it clear they expect more from their players, but I don't think that means they're blaming their players. I think those are two different things. At least I know behind the scenes, they're blaming themselves. My opinion on this whole season in K-State basketball is pretty simple. You know, I believe Bruce Weber and his coaching staff are still a quality group. Um, I think that's been proven. I think they do deserve to be safe at the time being and have given reason to believe if you're a positive person or even, I don't know, neutral person that this program can grow forward once again um, with the staff they have, excuse me, the class they have coming in and their track record doing so in the past. You know, that said, that is not an excuse for what's taken place this season or said to suggest that people should be okay with it. They should not be. I think people personally, this is opinion here. Um, we all have them. We don't have to agree with mine. It's totally fine. But I think people should have been okay with a 500-type season that maybe even saw K-State miss at NIT, even though I'm sure many will think that bar is too low, and I'm sure, and that could be debated. But I think that would have been an okay season. I would have wanted to see more. I probably expected to see more, but I think that would have been acceptable. This kind of type of season, however, is not going to reach that level for sure. 
um, and will understandably leave fans demanding improvement next season. And I think that's pretty fair at this point. They should expect that. So, you know, I guess that's how I look at it. And when I go through these opinion things, I hope people know it's, it's not trying to get you to feel the way I feel. That's not what media should do. It's not what I should do. You shouldn't have to agree with me. But if people want to know how I feel about it, that's how I feel about it. And it's not been a fun season, you know, for you guys to watch, for us to cover, for those guys to coach, for those guys to play. So um, understandable why so many people are, are, are upset about it. I think that wraps it up for me today on KSO Today. I always appreciate your time and you listening to me. We'll be back tomorrow with Derek Young. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your Monday.